Hey folks, Cozzy here for Pick One Pack One, and welcome back to part two of our Draft 101 What Makes a Quality Card series. In this video, we're going to be looking at Quadrant Theory and we're going to be looking at Cabs Theory. But first, let's go back to the rating system that I gave you last time, and we'll talk through my thought process on these particular vanilla test cards. For the Lathrae Ranger, I feel as though it comfortably passes the vanilla test. It's already a 2 cost 2-2, two -two, so it's a bear. It's the kind of card you can get down early. And if you ever manage to turn it into a 4-4, four -four, then you are laughing. And that's not that uncommon if you build your deck around it correctly. The Onu Ronin, I think, is not only a constructed playable card, it's probably either the best or second best fire card common that you can get in limited. Probably the second best. Torch is pretty phenomenal. And the reason why is because if you can get in, it's a 1 cost 2 1 which will trade with other creatures that only have 2 health. So often you'll be able to get the value of only of getting something that costs your opponent 2 with your creature that only costs you 1 and you get the upside of the war cry ability. Furthermore, if they get in more than once, you're laughing. Generally, for the one drops, I like mine to have two power. And the reason why is because when you have 25 health for a one power creature, that's 25 turns you need to attack to kill them. That's never going to happen. At least with two power, you'll cut it down in half instantly to 13. So you are beginning to apply some realistic pressure. Three attacks with this guy and they've lost a fifth of their health. Next up we have the Aerial Ace, and I'm sorry mate, but you're not going to make the cut even though I think you have the best creature type I've ever heard of in Barbarian Serpent. I have no idea what that looks like, where in the mystic and rustic tribes they find some kind of snake slash tortoise that they <laughs> teach in their ways. But either way, Flying and Aegis are both reasonable abilities, but if you're paying 5 for a 2-3 and your opponent pays 5 for a 6-5, it doesn't matter how evasive or whether it's got a little bit of protection, that guy's just going to get crunched and he's going to sit there as one of your most expensive cards, twiddling his thumbs and looking like the entertaining paradox that he is. So sorry Aerial Ace, you're not getting picked in any of my decks unless I'm absolutely desperate. How about the Crown Watch Cavalry? Yeah, this ends up being a 4 cost for 4-4 four, four amount of stats on the condition that I have a creature. And if we look at the colors that I'm playing, it's kind of the colors that like to have creatures. The other thing is there are chances for it to get even bigger. If this is in a Rakano deck with Warcry and he becomes a 3-3 three, three or a 4-4 four, four and that gets doubled, then I see this ability giving me a potentially huge upside. What is more, in some respects, the 2 power and 2 health on this creature gets charged because you can put it on a creature that's already been played, is already sitting around, and then they can attack in with that boost straight away, which allows your 2-3, which was redundant by your opponent's 3-4, to suddenly become a 4-5 and be the biggest creature on the table. This guy comfortably passes the vanilla test for me. And then finally, Marison's Disciple. I realized I should have explained that the 1-1 Scorpion uh, has uh, Death Touch, the Locust has Flying, and the Sandcrawler has a form of Evasion. But when you think about it, for any of those options other than the Scorpion, you're still getting 4 power and 4 toughness over 2 separate bodies. And those 2 separate bodies represent a form of resiliency that I like, because you can kill one and then the other half still lives. So yeah, I think Marison's Disciple comfortably passes our vanilla test. But let's move on to a new concept to add to our vanilla test. We can now look at this, uh, the power and health of each creature and go, that's our benchmark. But I want to add another concept for us to contemplate. Namely that any stage of the game can be broken up into four main categories. And we want our creatures to be useful in as many of those categories as possible. So the four categories that we have are development. The development stage of the game is generally up until about turn four. You know the drill, power, Wait, power creature, power creature, extra power two creatures or equipment and a creature. And this is when we're just setting up. We haven't had any totally overwhelming attacks yet. Instead, we're just beginning to suss out the board, see the two, three stare off against each other or the equipment, to get the idea of which is the must kill creature right now. And so this is the developmental phase. So whenever we look at a card, we can ask ourselves, is this helpful for whilst I'm developing the board? Next, we can look at when the board is at a parity state, or perhaps another word that you could use for this is at a stalemate. So once we've all got our stuff out, we've only got one card in our hand or we're both in a top deck state, either the board's empty because we've 
totally traded off all our resources or the board is chockers because they're all staring at each other and playing tiddlywinks. Do we have a card that helps us break through the parity to find an advantage that will allow us to start to attack rather than do nothing? The next quadrant that we want to think through is, is this card useful when I'm ahead? Does it help me win faster? Does it help me just put my foot on the throat of my opponent and just make sure that they cannot get up again? And so does it have that skill set that allows me just to smash through? A good example of that was the Lothrari Ranger that we saw in the vanilla test. If she gets in and hits for the first two damage, that's probably because my opponent didn't cast a two drop. So now all of a sudden I have a four power, four health creature that is bigger than most three drops in the game. So that's a great card for helping me get ahead. Whether she helps me in development or parity, there are two other questions I want to ask myself. And then finally we have what is probably the most important of the four quadrants. Is this a card that helps me get back when I'm behind? Let's face facts, you don't always get to start on the play. You don't always have your plan go right. You might get power screwed, you might get flooded, they might have three creatures down to your two and one of them's just gotten bigger. Will this card that I'm looking at help me change that so I can catch up? If you have a card that fulfills all four of these criterion, and generally that's rare. Generally you have a card that does three, two, and a bad card will only do one. But if you ever have a card that does all four, that's probably when you're looking at what we like to call a bomb. And it's one of those cards that probably fits on the S tier. So if you're ever to go over to the RNG website and look at whatever cards they have, not in the D tier here that's chaff, but right up the top here, these are probably the cards that fulfill the majority of our quadrants and importantly they fulfill the one from when you're behind. So let's take a look at some of these cards to practice this concept. Here we have the card that the S tier was actually originally named after, the Sandstorm Titan. Now the vanilla test will tell us straight away that he's a good card. He is a 4 cost 5-6 which is huge, absolutely enormous. But does he help us with our other stages of the game? Does he help us when, our when we are developing? And I'd argue, yes. Once we get up to 4 power, which is reasonable to do, by turn 4, he becomes another creature that keeps enlarging our board, and when we cast him, he is probably going to be the biggest, meanest creature on the table. Does he help when we're at parity? Again, I think he'd also help us in this scenario. He's a 5-6, which is one of the larger creatures in the game. He stops creatures from flying, which might open up opportunities for us. And he's cost efficient. What about whilst we're ahead? Certainly, if they've got one less creature than us and we drop the 5-6, we're laughing. And then finally, does he help us when we're behind? And I think this is the thing that elevates him into the very top tier. Let's say that I'm up against a blue-based flyers deck and they have two... 3-1 flyers in the air. And if I was just to draw a normal 5-5, I'm in trouble. Whereas this guy, he stops my opponent's units from flying, so he can slow down a flying onslaught. He has six health, so he can block effectively. And what is more, he has endurance. And what that means is, if the coast is clear from slowing down, if he's able to stop them enough, let's say they got two two twos and we're in a top deck war, then I can start to attack in as well to start to move the tempo and make my opponent start to be nervous about their life total. And what that means is, is that they're less likely to continue attacking me. So this is a guy who fulfills all four quadrants. And as a result, he is a very easy to assess bomb. Let's take a look at another one. The Pyro Knight is a very cheap creature. She only costs one, she's a 2-1. And she has the ability of Overwhelm, which means that when she attacks and is blocked by a creature, if she has any spare power, it goes straight to your opponent's face. And then she has the ultimate ability where you can pay 6 to give her plus 4, plus 4. Is she a good card? Well, on the vanilla test, she'd seem like an okay card and getting better depending on how much you like those abilities. And how much you like those abilities are probably going to be assessed by looking at our quadrant theory. So let's go back and ask ourselves, when we're trying to develop, does she help us? Well, she's a one drop two one who can attack straight away if they don't happen to get their two drop out. So yes, she's really useful in development. What about when we're at parity? Not the best, depending on what stage of the game we're at. She's a 1-drop who becomes a 2-1, one, 
So she's probably going to get chumped out by some people, but she has a second ability that is definitely worth paying attention to, which I'll get to in a moment. When you're ahead, she's great. She'll just keep hitting harder and harder. You equip her up, and whatever blocker they get, unless they have more health than her power, they're going to keep taking damage. So this is a phenomenal card for when you're ahead. And then finally, when you're behind, can this card help you out? Well, this is where her ultimate is quite interesting. Let's say that it's turn 7. And ordinarily in turn 7, if you are to draw a 1-drop like that Oni Ronin we showed before for the... For the um, for the vanilla test practice, then we're in trouble. He's not going to do much at all. This one, however, if we have seven power open and we play her, we can pay one to make her a 2-1, then ultimate her straight away to have a 6-5. And that is probably enough to block something effectively and to help us get a little bit back into the game. I don't think she's quite as overwhelming as the Sandstorm Titan is. It's probably why I just call her an exceptionally good card rather than out and out bomb. But the fact that she is both good early because she can smash face and reasonable late really makes her a great card according to this quadrant test. And that's something you could have missed if you were just using the vanilla test alone. Now, this test doesn't have to be used just for creatures, although that's what I've talked about so far for simplicity's sake. Let's take a look at Suffocate. Suffocate is a removal spell that costs one and it kills a unit with three power or less. In the development phase, it could be useful. It could get rid of one of their creatures that say a 2-3 so I can attack with my 2-2-2s. Two, two, when we're at parity, depending on the nature of parity, it can still have uses. It can definitely remove a creature that uh, is getting in our way, maybe stopping an inconvenient double block. But if our parity is because we got fat creatures, then it loses a lot of value because of its condition of only being able to kill a unit with three or less. So it's not a guaranteed smash hit like Sandstorm Titan is. What about when we're ahead? Well, yeah, it's useful. If we're smashing face and they drop anything small, rather than having a chump blocker, which will slow down our clock, we can use it to remove. And then finally, if we're behind, depending on what they have, this could either be a good card or a bad card. So again, there's a big old question mark over Suffocate. This isn't totally premium removal because it does have a pretty significant clause. But if we're thinking about our pillars, it really helps with tempo. We can play a two drop on this on turn three whilst they're just playing one card. And we'll probably kill most three drops as well because the vanilla test tells us that most threes that people will be happy with have that magic number of three power. But it doesn't fulfill all of our quadrants. And so I'm a little bit suspicious. It's still a very good card, but it's not a phenomenal one. Finally, we can look at Wisdom of the Elders. And you'll notice here that I'm purposely picking cards that are all good. We could show a card that's rubbish and it'll be very easy to tell why it doesn't fit in. But I think it's more interesting to look at these that are contextual and have their elements of different quadrants. So you get a more subtle analysis. So Wisdom of the Elders, it is a double influence card, which is important. And it's a fast spell, so you can cast it whenever you want. And it allows you to draw two cards, giving a sweet, sweet value. Is it good in development? I'd argue it really is. One of the most useful uses of card draw is early in the game when you're desperate to get your sigils. If you get stuck on three sigils and your opponent continues to develop out and cast a four drop and a five drop whilst you're only casting three drops, you've probably lost the game. This card allows you to find your sigil for a small tempo loss so that you can keep developing. So I think it is a useful card in development. What about at parity when we have just a bunch of fatties sitting on the table or indeed we're in a top deck draw? top deck war rather. Well, this allows you to draw extra cards, which is great. And drawing extra cards gives you more options and possibly finding your removal or your fatty or whatever else to get into the game again. When you're ahead, it gives you more resources to make sure you don't fall behind. And finally, if you're behind, rather than just drawing a random card, this allows you to draw two random cards for the cost of three. And so it gives you a chance to dig further and further into your deck to try and find what is likely that one or two pieces of premium removal or bombs that you're desperate for to get back into the game. So even though it won't necessarily get you back in on its own, so that's why it's not an absolute top tier card, 
it helps in every single one of these scenarios without necessarily being best in class. And that's why Wisdom of the Elders is a card that I think is quite a bit better than what it looks like. The next concept to complement our quadrant theory is cabs theory. And this one I know I got from limited resources. So thank you guys. And it's a slightly facetious anagram. Cabs theory stands for the following. It stands for cards that, which isn't part of cabs because it's inconvenient, affect the board state. And this isn't so much an analytical tool as it is a rule of thumb. Basically, any card that you have, you want to make sure it does something. It can't just sit there and look pretty. Because if your opponent is playing proactive plays and you take a whole turn off to play a card that doesn't do anything, then you're in, pro you're in big trouble. Now, some cards are so powerful that you can disregard this rule a little bit because you know that in certain circumstances they'll help you out. But there are others, such as you gain three life, that aren't going to help you much at all. That isn't stopping your opponent from hitting you in the face. It isn't doing anything to change the board state. All it's doing is delaying the inevitable. And if you're in a top deck war, and I draw a 3-3, and you draw a card that gains you 3 life, I know which seat I'd rather be in. So let's take a look at two cards that can help us out with this, and actually compare and contrast. These are both cards that cost 2, that are spells that you have to cast on your turn, and that do 2 damage to the enemy player. Which is not really affecting the board state. Yes, you do a bit of damage to their face, but generally the way you win in limited isn't by burning them out. There just aren't enough burn spells to make a dedicated burn limited deck. So generally you win by playing creatures and hitting in the face with creatures. So you want to be able to interact with creatures. Caleb's Favor on the right lets you draw a fire sigil from your deck, which helps your development. Whereas Piercing Shot on the left deals two damage to an enemy unit as well. As you can see, Piercing Shot affects the board state because it can kill something that only has two health, as well as doing the extra damage. Caleb's Favor is still okay. It draws you a sigil, so if we were to go back to our Quadrant Theory, we realize that it's very useful in helping our development, but it's totally rubbish when we're behind, it's okay when we're ahead, and not super great when we're at parity. But Piercing Shot actually affects the board, so you could argue that it's more useful in some of those other scenarios. If we're behind, because I'm on 8 life, my opponent's on 10 and they have a 2-2, I know which one of these two cards I'd want to be drawing. So there you go. Here's the fundamentals then of looking at what makes a quality card. And I don't feel as though I'm reinventing the wheel here. What we just have are some helpful theories that I think capture in a pithy phrase things that should be going on in our head constantly. We have our three pillars of value, inevitability, and tempo. We have our vanilla test of just working out what the very basic benchmark is for a card. We have our quadrant theory of thinking of when is this card applicable. And if you can find a card that's applicable in, when you're down, that's a card you definitely want in your deck. And then finally, we can always remember cabs. And if you put these things together, I reckon you're going to start drafting better decks than before because you're just going to be drafting quality cards that are intrinsically powerful. In our next video series, we're going to be looking at cards that are contextually powerful, that va whose values change according to the other cards around them and that are much more difficult to assess according to tier lists. So I hope you join me for my next series in Draft 102, looking at deck building, and card analysis within a context. I've been Cozzy for Pick One, Pack One. Thank you as always for listening, and I hope you enjoy some of the other videos on our channel. Have a good one.